Hi guys. I hope you're all enjoying the gorgeous weather. Uh, if you're outside of Ireland, we call this the uh, leaving south weather because basically this is the week that the kids will all start doing their exams, the state exams. And this is the week we are guaranteed to have nice weather. Always, always, always. So today's case is a murder case and it's also technically an unsolved case. And it begins basically with the discovery of a young woman murdered and it go, you know, it kind of evolves into this legend, so to speak, like this tale of this woman who was murdered in the Dublin mountains and her killers are never brought to justice. But like most tales, there is a, you know, a real story behind it. And uh, so we're going to talk about that today. So it was just after dawn on the 9th of June, 1925. It was a Tuesday. And a labourer named Felix Riley was up in the Dublin Mountains heading to work. And as he came to the crossroads at Ticknock, he saw a woman lying on the ground. From first glance, it just looked like the woman was sleeping. And so he began to just kind of, you know, walk past until he noticed that one of her shoes was not on her foot. It was kind of strewn to the side, like. So he went over then to try wake her. And as he got closer to the body, he noticed a trickle of blood coming down from her mouth. And then looking at her blouse, there was a small little bit of blood. Immediately, Felix jumped up and ran to the nearby pub, Lamb Doyle's, where he raised the alarm and police would be on the scene quickly and a murder investigation would be launched. So the woman was like really well dressed. She had a grey kind of like two piece skirt and suit, like jacket with a dark pink blouse on. She had a beehive hat. I'll try to get a photo of that. And on it, there was like a red rosette. And from what I've read, her hair was in like a kind of like a bob style. And like that, she had these kind of black patent shoes on. Well, one on and one off. An appeal was put out for information on the unidentified woman, you know, to try find out who she was. And eventually people started coming forward saying that her name was Lizzie O'Neill. Some people said her name was Lily. And the other name, which you probably know, that people insisted she was called, was Honor Bright. So before I continue on with, you know, the murder and the investigation, I thought I'd just tell you a bit more about this woman. So like that, most people knew that she was called Honor Bright. And obviously that was like the pseudonym or whatever that she went by. But then most people thought her name was Lizzie O'Neill or like that, it has been also said Lily, right? So I think then the kind of guess is that Lily and Lizzie are so close, kind of, that like people just mistook what she was saying or something, I don't know. But if you can believe, on the 11th of June, 1900, Mary Kate O'Neill was born. She was the sixth child born to Michael and Kate O'Neill. One of her sisters was called Mary, and so that she wouldn't be confused with her mother or her sister, she was, you know, referred to as Lily. I don't really understand why you would call your child Mary Kate then. Why you didn't just call them L Lily or something in the first place? Why call them? And I think that happens a lot where people are called after, like, you know, a parent or an aunt or whatever. But then they go by a different name, you know, as not like to avoid confusion. And I don't know why you just don't call your child something different in the first place. So they lived in, and I know I'm going to say this wrong, Greg in a spittage in Carlow. When she was only three years old, her father Michael died, and by the time she was eight, her mother died. So I'm going to assume that, like, there's not a lot on her, but I'm going to then just assume it was kind of like the older siblings then just kind of had to look after the younger siblings, that type of thing. Maybe there was, like, other relatives that looked after as well. Like many Irish people, I think especially from the rural areas, um, the US was a very, you know, prosperous option or, you know, that people took. And so in 1905, her 20 year old brother Edward moved to the US. In 1907, Mary followed. And by 1917, Patrick left. So in 1918, Lily, who was 18, headed to Dublin. 
And so it's actually said that she worked in two different shops, like the sources say two different ones. So there was Pims on Kildare Street and Switzer's on Grafton Street. And Switzer's, I think, was then bought over by like Brown Thomas. So both shops were very, very like high end. They were very well respected positions that she would have had as a sales assistant. You know, they were very respectable, very like. And so unfortunately, on the night of November 1920, Lily gave birth to a little boy and she called him Kevin Barry O'Neill. Kevin Barry after the um, Republican who had been executed I think just recently before that. There would be no father's name on the birth certificate but this really you know well respected sought after position that she had you couldn't be you couldn't be having kids out of wedlock and so she lost the job and so it's pretty much said that not by choice, she then took to the streets to try earn some money. Now, she gave Kevin to a woman named Margaret McGill. I don't know a name of another, if there, you know, of a husband or anything like that, but I would have to assume that, she, you know, she couldn't give it to another single woman. I think she would have had to give it to someone who was either married or widowed or, or something like that, um, or a bit older or something. So it is believed that they did live together for some time because they lived at 2 Catherine Street. There is records of that. And then Lily would go on to live in other places. And Kevin and Margaret, who were like Kevin went by Kevin McGill then, they lived in 2 Catherine Street. A lot of the records show that Lily then lived at 48 Newmarket Street. And like would say like she lived in like the middle room of the house because obviously like the different rooms were rented out or whatever. Um, now, it is also recorded, one of the sources says that in the weeks up to her, coming up to her death, she lived or was staying in a hostel for unmarried mothers. And it was actually the same place. It was 76 Harcourt Street. And it was the same place that became a safe house for Michael Collins. So this place was basically like the Legion of Mary and it was to help unmarried mothers. And it was set up by Frank Duff. And so he would obviously try to help, um, obviously all the women, but he would be trying to help um, Lily. And I believe by this point she had already started calling, going by Lizzie. This is kind of where Lizzie O'Neill then comes into it. Um, whether this was kind of after she moved up to Dublin or maybe after she had Kevin. I'm not really sure when she began calling herself that. Now, apparently how the whole Honor Bright thing came about. I don't know if that's like a, a thing already. Was that like a like a folk tale or, or something? I'll look it up and I'll try to find out. But how apparently she comes to get that name is your man Kevin goes out to look for her after he, after she doesn't come back to the hostel for a couple of nights. And like that, he goes down to, you know, kind of around Stephen's Green and finds her there, you know, working. And, you know, he's like asking her to come back to the hostel and stuff. And she says that she will. And apparently she's like, no, I know I will come back. And then says, honour bright, I will. So I don't know, is that kind of a thing people said, you know, like, like cross my heart, I will or something. Is it, you know, that kind of saying? I don't know. But, um, yeah, apparently that's how she got the name. So, going back to the day of the murder, when Lily's body had been found, word, you know, kind of spread quickly. And at this point, there wasn't a lot of, you know, murder. So, this would have been a really sensational thing, especially the fact that, you know, like, it was a woman of the night or a prostitute or whatever who had been found. And so, locals, like, you know, people started gathering around the body like basically around a crime scene and it's actually mad now i'm gonna put the photo up so like skip ahead a couple of seconds or something if you want if you don't want to see it because it is it is the body of lily but you can see all these men just kind of like sitting there standing around gawking at her and it just seems mad like i just feel like to be all just standing there gawking at her and she's just looking you know or she's just lying there obviously and they're waiting for the police or whatever to come and another thing that was said was like her face had no kind of um emotion to it isn't the right word but like there was no pain in her face there was no she wasn't grimacing she wasn't you know so it's pretty much thought that like she died instantly from the bullet wound there was very little blood as i said there was a little bit that came out of her mouth because um the bullet went they basically said the bullet went through her heart and then into her lung so that would have obviously caused the coughing up of the blood and um 
there was no other blood except for like the little bit in her in her blouse so the police kind of thought that she could have been killed somewhere else and then just dumped here and also at this point locals in the area no one reported screaming or a gunshot or anything like that no one reported any type of disturbances her body was actually taken to the outhouse of Lamb Doyle's. So I'm just going to read out basically what Superintendent Reynolds um, found on Lily's person. So I'm just going to read from his notes of what he said. The feet of the body were about two feet from the ditch to the side of the road. I searched the pockets. I found, found in them a pair of kid gloves, a handkerchief, a purse contained one shilling and five pennies, also in the pocket was a half crown, a six penny bit, and a seven and a seven and a half D in coppers, a hair comb, a packet of woodbine cigarettes, one player's cigarette, and three cigarette butts. In the left hand of the deceased was the coloured handkerchief produced. There was an end of a cigarette in her costume, a scent bottle and some loose matches, a box of face cream. Photo exhibit A other articles exhibit B. It's not like her to have all that on her in her in on her person or whatever. Now there's an interesting bit where that's all he says and he says a box of face cream. So later on in that report then right so all face cream photo exhibit A other articles were all heavily like they're all scribbled out and then the, the a new sentence saying a box containing a Malthusian sheet was also in pocket. That was like a type of condom. So it's weird that like that wasn't mentioned at the time, but then it was mentioned later. So it's been kind of speculated. Did they do that to make it? Because obviously then it would have even been worse. Like, oh, she was prostitute. Oh, and she had a condom. You know, like it's kind of like nearly to be kind of like, well, it doesn't matter that she died. So just to go to the day before the murder. Monday, the 8th of June. Lily, or Honor Bright, was getting ready in 48 Newmarket like that getting dressed in her little grey two-piece suit and stuff like this so like she dressed very well I would have thought she dressed very well for prostitute but maybe at the, that time they did dress that well or like that maybe it was just because she would have had outfits you know she would have had to wear those type of outfits when she did go to work in the store and so maybe then she just had them so why not wear them kind of thing so she and her like housemate uh, Madge Hopkins who went by Bridie got ready and at 11 p.m they left the house to head to work. They headed towards Stevens Green and then at Bishop Street they actually parted ways so they obviously worked or whatever they done and at around 1 a.m they actually met up the Shelburne garage at Stevens Green and then the two of them walked over to like these chain fences and sat there basically obviously just chatting and waiting for clients. It was at this point that a two-seater little grey sports car pulled up in front of them. The man in the car called them over and they chatted and he said that he was going to go into the Shelburne to pick up his friend and we'll be back out. And the driver of the car was Dr. Patrick Purcell and his friend who he was going inside to get was Superintendent Leopold J. Dillon. So the Dr. Purcell is actually from Blessington, like he's married with like two kids. He has like a small GP practice in the town and he's also a peace commissioner. I think this is kind of how he ends up um, being involved with, with the police, like having work with them. So, you know, through different things for work, they, the two men knew each other. And that day, that afternoon, they actually had a meeting for whatever. And Dylan, the superintendent, said that he had to go into Dublin later that evening for a meeting. And Purcell said that he also had to go. So he's like, oh, so I'll give you a lift in and back. Because remember, cars are not a big thing at the time. Not everyone had them like that, even not all the police would have had them. But I feel like maybe Purcell didn't really have to go into Dublin. He just wanted to go to Dublin because like Blessington's not that far from Dublin now. But like back then it was probably like a world away. So it was like, oh, Dublin, I want to go. Be bold. So after their meeting in Blessington, they had a couple of drinks there. Then they headed into Dublin city centre but at around 4pm. But at the time they stopped at the barracks in Blessington. Dylan approached one of the guards on duty and asked to like have a loan of two of the raincoats which one of the sources of notes like it's weird because like it's a summer day it's nice out so like why would you think you need them 
But anyway, they were given a lend of two raincoats. At 5 p.m., they stopped at the Railway Hotel in Nice for another few drinks. At around half six, they made it into Dublin, already fairly on it. They had dinner and then they like parted ways because obviously Dylan had to head off to his meeting. So Dylan took a tram out to Sandy Cove for his meeting and without any hesitation, Ursel straight away headed out to Donnybrook to meet some prostitutes. So he picked up two women and they actually went to a pub in Donnybrook for a couple of drinks. So the three of them left the pub and they bought a bottle of whiskey to bring with them. And uh, Purcell then drove along St. Organ Road till he found a little private spot. And basically, one of the women stayed in the car drinking the whiskey and he went off with the other one to have sex. It's probably very cheeky to say, but like I feel like the other prostitute kind of got an easy way. She's like, oh, I'm just getting some free whiskey and I don't even have to do anything. Because <laughs> when I saw about when I read it, when I started to read it and I said two women, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, straight away, you know, two women having sex with two and whatever, but he doesn't. He only has sex with one and the other one gets to just sit there drinking her whiskey. He then dropped the two women to their, you know, individual um, houses. He met a third prostitute at the end of Grafton Street. And again, they obviously have business or whatever. And then he drops her home to Drumcondra. So then like that, he gets back in kind of between half 12 and one outside the Shelburne Hotel. And this is where he pulls up and sees the two women sitting on the fence. He would insist that they called, you know, that they shouted over to him, although it was said that he shouted over to them, whichever. So like that, he said he was going in to get his friend and asked the two women to wait for them outside. When he went in, he found Dylan like sleeping on a chair inside, obviously got him up, out they go. So the two men and two women are outside of the car. And Purcell starts talking to Bridie and they agree on a price and head off for somewhere private. And it's said then that like that, Honor Bright and Dylan were just kind of stood by the car talking. Now listen, if you know the story, you probably already know that the idea is that the two men um, said they were robbed by a prostitute and that if they found her, they'd kill her, all this. And so you kind of get the impression that the idea is supposed to be that Honor Bright is the one that they met earlier and that they then find her later and kill her. However, when Purcell and um, Bridie start walking off, they come across them, you know, like the taxi drivers and stuff. And like kind of they start, like Purcell starts a conversation with the men kind of out of the blue and then goes on to say like that, that he had been robbed earlier that day by one of the prostitutes he was with. Purcell said, I am after being done in tonight of £11. What is worse, I have lost a silver cigarette case that I would not wish for £20 to lose, a presentation case. Only I had this single note in my back pocket where I keep my revolver, she would have got that too. And at this point, he like pats his um, like hip pocket and the taxi driver, the taxi drivers and um, Bridie would say that they saw, you know, something, they could tell that there was something kind of bulky in the pocket. And it is said that he said, if I meet her, I will do for her. She wore a grey dress, had fair bobbed hair, was good looking. I would know her and if I don't meet her, I will take out another and leave her in the country where she will not be found. My friend is a superintendent in the police. I have a civic guard coat on me at present. If she attempts to pass that cigarette case, he will find it out. He could clear the whole green of them with his revolver. So like, I get it. We just, just He just basically describes Honor Bright. But he just saw Honor Bright like very easily like not in passing or anything they were stopped talking to them like you couldn't have been that infatuated with Bridie that you didn't even notice what her friend looked like so I just feel like that's not what happened I don't know it's just weird like right so we don't really know what Honor Bright and Dylan then really did because we only have Dylan's statement to go by so that's what we have and he basically would say that he took Purcell's car then and they drove around Stevens Green and then he admits then that they had sex and that he then basically just took whatever cash he had out of his pocket and gave it to her and this was five shillings and a half penny. So at this point he drove back around to like to the Shelburne but on the way 
owner asked would he drop her to Newmarket because it was only like a couple of roads over but he said no because it wasn't his car and he couldn't keep it away from Purcell for much longer so they all drove like the two of them drove back to the Shelbourne and then it said that she stayed in the car until 2 40 a.m so it is said then that at this point she hails a taxi and like gets in it and so Dylan would be adamant that this is the last time he saw her so by 2 40 a.m Purcell and Bridie still hadn't come back I'm guessing wherever they had gone off to um because there's no mention of Purcell at that time and then surely like if Bridie had come back as well the two women would have went off together so at this point the taxi that she got into was being driven by Ernest Woodruff and so he actually recognized Honor because obviously like from being around the green and stuff they they would know each other's faces probably even gave her a lift before and he would say that she seemed very upset and on edge and he asked her was she okay but there's no kind of clear evidence recorded anyway of him saying that like she answered either way so he just drove so the taxi drove along Merrion Row and then onto Adelaide Road and then just as they went under the railway bridge at Harcourt Road Honor asked him to stop the car and she got out to have a smoke but that she kept like looking you know down you know down the road that they had just come up and stuff like that obviously Dylan would say would be adamant that like nothing wrong had happened that you know she was fine when he when she left him and stuff, right? And when it came to the trial, uh, the men who would go forward basically to be charged, their defence team argued that Woodruff could not say that Honor Bright seemed upset and on edge and anxious and stuff like this because they were basically saying that it claimed it was hearsay. Even though that's not like, oh, someone said this to someone, you know, it's no, like... I saw her, I saw the person and this is how she appeared. She seemed upset. Like someone doesn't have to say, I am upset for you to kind of gather that they're, they're upset. But anyway, so this would never be known to the jury. After she finished her cigarette, the taxi then went along Harrington Street to the corner of Clambrassel Street. So this is basically called Leonard's Corner. And in a lot of the sources, this is what's um, what it's referred to as. Honor got out here at Leonard's corner and paid the taxi. He then turned the car to head back the same way he had just come. And as he got to the corner of Harrington Street, a car flew past him in the opposite direction. And it was a small two-seater sports car. As I said earlier, there wasn't a lot of cars around at this time. So like a sports car is going to be very clearly identifiable and distinguishable. Woodruff would later identify Purcell as the driver of the car. And they were basically heading down the way that he had just left on her. Around 2.30 a.m., Constable Burke, who was stationed at Ternier, was walking across the junction of Ratgar Avenue with Harold's Cross. And he saw a two-seater car parked at Harold's Cross Road. Basically, there was two men and a woman outside of the car. He said that the woman was very, you know, kind of emotional and animated and, and speaking very loudly to the two men. So obviously he was a bit like, mm, what's going on? And started heading towards them. However, when they saw him coming towards them, then the three of them hopped back into the car. And again, the woman was still speaking very kind of like animated to them, but they he couldn't kind of tell what they were saying, but the car flew off. So even then, that's a bit odd that she would be willing to get back into the car with them. Although I suppose because she's um, a prostitute or a sex worker, you know, she could be wearing kind of like, well, that's just causing, like, that's bringing more trouble on yourself by getting the police involved. The car took off in the direction of Ternier, and this would be the last sighting of the grey two-seater sports car. At 4.25 a.m. the following morning, Jane Hamilton, who was a servant at Blessington Civic Guard Barracks, heard a car coming into the station. Guard McCaffrey was stationed at the barracks and he was woken by someone banging down the door of the outer building. Dylan and Purcell uh, arrived in and they asked McCaffrey to get them like a glass of water each and then Dylan asked him to go get uh, a motorcycle from the shed. By the time he got back with the motorbike, Purcell was already gone in his car and Dylan made several attempts to try to get the motorcycle, the motorcycle to start, the motorbike to start. Um, it wouldn't, so eventually then he just slept at the barracks. McCaffrey went into um, the day room, it says, and saw his, like, overcoat in there thrown on one of the chairs. And, like, he said he was not in it that day, and that's definitely not where he left it. When he picked it up, he noticed that there was, like, white stains on it. 
are little briar like little leaves from briars and stuff on it so obviously he was like what's going on at 4 35 a.m kathleen purcell would say that her husband had arrived home waking her and then we know that uh, only a couple of hours later honor bright would be found dead at ticknock there was a lot of stuff that went weird right so basically um the coroner for south county dublin dr jp brennan right the day after her body was found, he was supposed to then kind of like do like the inquest. And he would say, I don't know if you saw that. So he would say that at the request of the police that it be postponed. There was no reason given for why or by, who, you know, who had asked for this. And then it was said that it was to be postponed for two weeks. And then this became another four weeks. So it was nearly six weeks by the time this went ahead. So within the days after the murder, Daddy obviously investigating once they found out where, once they found out that Honor was, you know, a sex worker and where she worked, they obviously went around that area, asked people stuff. And so they had several witness statements describing like where Honor was that day and night. And then the two men, the two men describing what they looked like and that one of them owned a grey sports car, two-seater sports car. So very quickly they were able to identify um, Purcell and Dylan. After about five or six days, both men were brought in for questioning and they would both agree and sign a statement that they had been in the company of Bridie and Honour that night. They were interviewed a second time and this time they gave a lot more detail and they agreed with pretty much everything that the witnesses had said that they had seen them do or say or whatever. But they were both then adamant that they had left Honour when last time they saw her was when she left the green in a taxi. So at this point, is Purcell saying that he also saw her? Like, was she there? I don't know where he's coming into this. Because, I don't know, I just think it's weird. Because if it's, if it's like, oh, a prostitute robbed me and I wanted my money back and I killed her or whatever, you know, as revenge. That's not the one you were with. You were with Bridie and Dylan ended up, ended up being with Honor. And if it is a fact that she was one of the ones you were with earlier, I honestly don't know how you wouldn't have recognised her as soon as you saw the two women. You know what I mean? So it's just really weird. Unless, now here's me just going off on a conspiracy then now, unless he did see her, noticed them when he pulled up and was like, there's that. And said, you know what? And said, girls, you know, oh, you know, wait or whatever. Um, go in and get my friend and come back and nearly be like, okay, well, like you scare her, you're the police officer or whatever, so you're going to scare her. I'll take the other one off or whatever. And you bring her off somewhere to scare her into giving you the money back or something and that that's how the whole thing happened. But if that happened, do you not think that when he pulled up, Honor would have mentioned sobriety like, oh, I was with him earlier, like I was already with this, customer, with this client or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And that Bridie then would mention that to the police. So I feel like that was just a whole hole of blue that I'm just having to make it up in my head and that we really didn't need to talk about. But then I'm still very confused about the motive behind why they killed Honor. Two weeks after the murder of Honor Bright, Dylan would be fired from the Civic Guard and both him and Purcell would be arrested for her murder. Obviously, this was a huge thing. Like, you know, the the newspapers and stuff loved it because it was such a thing. Like, a woman of the night was murdered and, oh, it was a doctor and a policeman who'd done it. And, you know, all this stuff. It was just really, like, it was all over the tabloids and the news and stuff like that. Also, like that, the Civic Guard isn't even really that long about. So this is, like, it said, like, this really shook it to its core because it's such a it was such a new thing anyway. And then for this kind of big disaster to happen. So when the inquest finally went ahead, like the place was packed. It was in the National School in Sandyford and like people had to kind of just stand outside and everything. And so um, Dr. Thomas L. O'Mahony would say that the bullet fired must have been from a distance of six to ten feet away because none of Honor's clothes were singed and um, that the wound could not have been self-inflicted. Dr. Jazz Neely would state that there was no marks like of external violence to Honor's body. Like, so obviously there was no other like bruising or cuts or broken bones or anything like that. There was no nothing else other than the shot. And as I said already, it, like it's a remark even in one of the sources that like you wouldn't even know she was like even like your man thought that she was just asleep because her face or anything didn't give anything away. Her clothes were not ripped or anything, um, so it didn't seem like there had been a struggle. Both doctors said that Honor had been shot through the right breast. The bullet had penetrated straight through her heart and her left lung before lodging just under her left shoulder blade. So 
Inspector O'Connell then gave evidence that um, he was shown the overcoat that Purcell had borrowed and that like that it had the stain on it and the briars, um, you know, like stuck on it. And so he actually went to the scene of the crime and there was briar bushes there and he could see that some looked like they had been disturbed and some didn't. So then on the 30th of July 1925, the coroner's jury returned a verdict of guilty for willful, willful murder. The next day at the Dublin District Court, Purcell and Dillon appeared to be charged with the murder. When asked, you know, with the conclusion of the evidence if they wanted to say anything, Purcell said, I am absolutely innocent. And Dylan said, I wish to state nothing except that I am innocent. So on the 2nd of February, 1926, their trial began. So just a quote from the chief prosecutor, William Carrigan. You are dealing with a pair of moral degenerates who quitted their families and their responsibilities to spend a night of debauchery in the city of Dublin. It is a hideous tale culminating in the deliberate and cold mur cold-blooded murder of one of the unhappy victims of their lust. So one of the main things was, you know, the taxi drivers would say that Purcell said about, you know, having the gun, the revolver on him and stuff like that and saying, um, you know, that he was going to do her in or something. So he denies saying that. He also denies having a revolver on him and he says, no, sure, in my hip pocket, I always carry my stethoscope. And Carrigan to this would say, did you have your stethoscope on you on the day you were arrested? And he said, no. And he said, do you have your stethoscope on you now? And Purcell said no. The whole thing about Purcell's revolver also then, um, because he said no, I didn't have it on me, it was at home. Or And then like his wife would say, yeah, that she noted like when he was out that night that she was, you know, doing something and she noted it was in one of the drawers, like in the kitchen or something. But other people would come forward to say that he had two revolvers. Captain Edward Hornage uh, said that Purcell would come to his, you know, like to for practice basically, and would use two revolvers. So the defense basically tried to say two things for their defense was that the men had not seen Honor Bright after she left them in the taxi, and then they tried to flip it around on the taxi. Poor Ernest Woodruff, basically being like. Um, that he must have had a sinister motive and you know like oh sure why else would he be driving around town you know looking at all this you know, because because he's a taxi driver the trial went on for only three days um so on the 4th of february the jury went to deliberate the judge addressed the jury before they went for two hours and he said that in the eyes of the law honor bright occupied the same position as the first lady in the land and it would offer her the same protection as the jury left to deliberate, people obviously then began talking to each other about different things. People left to get air, to get drinks, you know, refreshments and stuff. And as they were all filing out, three minutes after the jury had left, they were back. They had made a decision. Three minutes with all that evidence. I know I'd done it in like the hangings and stuff like that where like there was very little, little stuff to say basically. So that was it. There was so much evidence. How could you have just decided in those three moments? Like, you were barely in the room you were going to deliberate in that time. Both men were found not guilty of the murder of Honor Bright. It's said that one of the papers obviously led that evening with, like, the breaking story, the breaking news. And then the next day, obviously, all the newspapers had it. And at the end, that was it. There was no more talk of Honor Bright, her murder. Who was responsible? Who was at large? So basically it is said that the superintendent's career was basically in ruins and that Purcell found it so difficult to, you know, stay in Blessington that he, him and his family then moved to England. And then there was a thing I came across, right, because so, obviously the whole thing is, oh, she was a sex worker, like she deserved it, you know, she risked this and it's just a warning to everyone else and stuff like that. And so a Catholic priest, of course, told an audience that her troubles began when she took an alcoholic drink at a local dance. This simple action, he claimed, led her down the inevitable path of vice and ultimately, Honour Bright was not, and is not, the only once decent Irish girl who traces back their ruin to drink at dances. Now, this next bit is obviously kind of the sad bit, but it's also the wild bits. Kevin McGill uh, grew up not knowing who his birth mother was or that his mother Margaret wasn't even his birth mother. And then in 1942, when he was 21, he wanted to join the British Army. And to do this, you needed your birth cert to prove your age. And it was at this point that he saw that 
his mom, Margaret, was not his birth mother. A woman named Lily, or Lizzie O'Neill was. And so his daughter, Patricia Hughes, basically says that throughout the years then he kind of, he did, he went back to, uh, to Ireland to kind of try find out more about his mother because he found out that she had been murdered and stuff like this. But, uh, you know, just kind of life and family and all things, you know, things get in the way. that He never did. And that shortly before he died, he told, he had told Patricia that he had always said he'd like to write a book about, you know, like about the history and his mother and all of this. And so she basically took on the reins, I suppose. And she also said that it wasn't, she didn't really do anything with it. And then, sorry now. Because I feel like it seems like such a bizarre thing, but I'm going to put it out there because obviously Anna Bright's granddaughter's putting it out there. She says it wasn't until 2006 when she saw a photo of WB Yeats. And so she shares a photo of her dad. Now it's a very kind of, obviously it's an old photo, it's hard kind of to see. And a photo of WB Yeats and she basically thinks that they look alike. And so the whole theory here is that Honor Bright was not a prostitute, or maybe could have been a prostitute, but was also a mistress. And she was having an affair with W.B. Yeats, who was married to a woman named George, who they didn't love each other, I think. He didn't love her, like, in a romantic way. Um, and that he would obviously have different affairs. Apparently, Maud Garn was the woman that he really, really, really loved and all this. But... Uh, yeah, Patricia Hughes goes into this whole thing and kind of puts dates together of even with his poetry where it kind of describes who could be on our right. And then the whole thing there is that the two men um were basically either that they were scapegoats or that they were involved, but that they had been hired kind of to kill her because I don't even think it was that WB Yeats got her killed, George did, and then um, you know, other things because WB Yeats became like a senator and um, this guy, Kevin O'Higgins, who was like his predecessor, I think, didn't want that scandal of like, oh, he had had a child out of wedlock and, you know, she could use that um, kind of like to blackmail him. Then George also apparently told Kevin O'Higgins that she was like a Republican spy and she was sending, you know, she was sending state secrets back to the IRA and stuff like this. So kind of that's where that theory goes is that that's who killed her and then that's why kind of like that the police put a delay on um the inquest and all this other stuff i don't really know to be honest when i first kind of looked at the photos i was like oh i kind of see it a little with the nose and the lips and stuff but it's a very hard it's a it's a very bad photo of kevin barry to kind of really distinguish it but anyway please let me know what you think of that theory or do you think it's as simple as it was the two men, you know? I think it was the two men purely because people kept saying, like, that they saw them and that they saw the car and even like that, that that police constable said, you know, like, saw them and stuff. But then, why go back in the car with them, you know, if you thought your life was in danger? What had been done kind of before that, that you, like, even if they had threatened you when you were in the car with them at the Shelburne and then you were like oh and you ran and you got into a taxi and you tried to get away from them and stuff I don't understand why you were the one they put the blame on then or like that was it just kind of how he said at the end of the night you know he hadn't found the woman who robbed him so he was just kind of you know you'll do kind of thing I don't know it's really weird but that's kind of really all I have on this story um so yeah let me know what you think I just feel like it's it's such a it's such a Historic one that we think of on our right, and then like for her name to be Mary Kate, you know, Mary Kate O'Neill. And you know, because of the way things were back then, that she had this good job and stuff, but because she became pregnant, that's mad because like the men never, the men don't lose their jobs over these things. And it's that's up until recently. There's a book I have, and I actually want to read it obviously because I got it. Um, A Guarded Life, and it's uh, Magellan Moynihan, I think she was actually on the late late before and it's about how she becomes pregnant when she's in the guards and like it's like the treatment and all and like that the men like the male people don't get the male people the male uh person involved that doesn't get the same punishment or you know prejudice or treatment or anything it's it's always just the woman that gets that well i guess this is the end of the story of honor bright 
Let me know what you think. If you do think it was them or you do think there was more to it. I feel like it's very black and white. The two lads just happen to get off. And I don't know why they got off. I really don't. Um, because really they just kind of tried to blame the taxi man. Which I thought was just not enough of a thing. I, I feel like there was a lot of different. Like there was witness statements. And there was other kind of physical evidence against them. So I just feel like it was really weird. And then like that. If she wasn't killed at the mountains. Where was she killed? Let me know what you think. Anyway, I hope you are enjoying all the sunshine. I hope you are wearing your sun cream. Don't, you know, learn the hard way like me. Um, If you haven't seen that video. But what video is it? I think it's the one about the bishop and the knighty. And I had gone out and I didn't realise that my little, the top I had on had these little kind of peephole bits on it. And so all here was just like lobster. Lobster shoulders. So, yeah, um, and I'm also working on that live. So everybody, for the live, everybody was like, oh, I want, oh, I want. Every um, seemed to be more interested in me doing a live. I'm saying I'm doing a live of a case. Instead of it just being a live and being like, hi guys, ask me questions so we can interact or something. I'll just do a case. And I don't really know what way we're going to do it yet. Um, but I think it would be good for it to be tr somehow interactive that I'm not just on a live doing a case like I do now. That it's somehow, you know, I might say a bit and then we'll talk about it and then we say a bit more. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll just kind of bring the theories of a case to you and see what you guys think and stuff like that. Um, if you have any specific Irish cases then, because that's what you guys said you prefer to see me do. Because I did say, oh, maybe I could do an American one just or an international one just because it's, you know, a one's laugh type thing. Um, but you guys really like the fact that I just do the Irish ones, which is why I started doing them in the first place, obviously, because it's it's a bit more of a unique thing, and yeah, the Irish cases need to be getting told. So yeah, let me know if there's a certain Irish case that you think would suit well, like if it has a lot of theories and stuff like that that you think we could all kind of talk together on a live about, rather than me just kind of being like, here's some information for you. That it's a bit more like, you know, I can say, okay, well, the first theory is this. And you guys can be kind of like, yeah, no, I, that's what I need towards. Or someone else can be like, no, because ABC, all this. Anyway, rambling as I do. Uh, thank you for all your support. I'm like nearly at three and a half thousand subscribers. So please, if you, ha if you don't already subscribe and you do enjoy the content, please subscribe. If you know other people who are interested in true crime, like you and me, let them know and tell them to subscribe. I'm trying to think if I could get to 4,000 by the end of June, wouldn't that be really good? Also, I'm coming up to like three years of doing the videos. Um, I have to check the exact date, but it's like the end of July going into August was when I've done my first one. Um, because like that, pandemic, COVID, isolation, lonely, bored, I had to channel all my creative energies into something. And I had been thinking about doing a YouTube channel for a while. So yeah, uh, nearly three years for this bad boy. So yeah, okay, that's it. Uh, thank you, and uh, we shall see you in the next video. Thanks, bye.